the reason I came to Rice was not just unparalleled excellence in research, but in teaching. And that is a very rare thing. And there are very few universities in this world that have both. And so I'm really proud to be here and to give a talk today about how I tried to make an undergraduate requirement an unforgettable experience. So my story starts when I first came to Rice in 2014. Uh, I was an assistant professor, and during faculty orientation, Josh Eiler, who was the director of CTE, played a very motivational video highlighting many of the impressive accomplishments of Professor Mickey Hebel. And you can look at this YouTube video. Uh, it's 2013, but it's completely timeless. And there were a couple of questions I asked myself after looking at this video. Was it actually possible to be a first-class, internationally renowned researcher, a teacher of the highest quality who continually brings out the best in her students, a devoted parent, and a 65-time marathon runner <laughs> all at the same time? Well, I could only answer one and two for myself. Uh, three, I'm hoping to answer for myself. And four, I'll never be able to answer because I'll never get them. But, for one and two, I decided that the answer not only was yes, it had to be yes. And here's why it had to be yes. I owed it to myself to be a first class researcher. I fell into applied probability and statistics because I loved the research. And this means the world to me every day. It's the reason I wake up early in the morning every day to solve new problems and to break ground in the field. But to be a first class teacher, was for me just as important for others. Others are just as important as yourself, if not even more. And so I had a personal teaching obligation. The first teaching obligation I had was to give students a classroom experience I craved when I was an undergraduate, but which I unfortunately never had. I didn't go to Rice as an undergraduate. Maybe it would have been different. But not only that, I had an obligation to my professional community to the greater statistics community at large. When you teach an intro course in statistics, you are the face of statistics to these students. And it would be up to me to create the best possible impression of probability and statistics. If I didn't do it, a student taking the class as a one-off requirement might never have a positive impression of statistics ever again. And we know how many people in the world are like that. They say statistics was the worst course I took in college. And I could not let that fall on my class. No, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. It was that important to me. So STAT 310 is this course, Probability and Statistics. It's a calculus-based introduction to probability and statistics required of most Rice engineering undergrads. And it's an interesting course in the sense that it differs from other courses that students have taken in the past because it's the first time where they see proofs and abstract ideas rather than just calculations. Proofs and abstract ideas are much more important than calculations in STAT 310. And so it's a difficult course to teach for that reason. And so a month or so after my arrival, I became aware that the class was notoriously difficult to teach effectively. So I would embark on a mission to create an undergraduate introduction to probability and statistics. I've never shied away from any challenge in my life and this would be no different, this introduction would have to be an unforgettable experience if I was to be able to sleep at night and know that I did the right thing. And so as I was thinking about this course, I developed it from scratch, and I said, what do I need to do to logically connect all the concepts in the course so that from one lecture to the next, everything is logically connected in a way that would be friendly to newcomers who have never seen any of these concepts. And what I did is that I took myself out of my 38-year-old mindset and said, what happens if I were 18 years old again, seeing this for the first time? How would I think about it? And I think that as researchers, it's critical that we take ourselves out of our current mindset when we teach these types of courses. And pretend even, even if we have to pretend, that we're seeing a concept for the first time, even if we've seen it millions of times before. Because there's no other way, at least in my view, that you can effectively articulate what it would be like for someone seeing it for the first time. I also, while I was trying to plan the course, tried to imagine 
what would an ideal instructor be from a student's perspective? And the following stood out to me most. First of all, I would need to convey tremendous enthusiasm each and every time. <laughs> Students are smart, really smart. Not only that, they're incredibly aware. If you're not absolutely 100% excited to be there in class, they're going to pick up on it immediately. Don't fool yourself and think otherwise. They really do. And not only that, if you don't convey intense passion for your own subject, why should they care about it anyways? If you represent statistics to them and you're not excited enough to be there, why should they care? And so this really motivated me. Another thing that motivated me was to start and end every class with a smile. I would remember student names. It sounds incredibly simple, but these two things alone go a long way, trust me. And the third is that you have to convince students why your subject is worth studying. So I'm going to go through three examples now that I interlace throughout STAT 310 to show them why this is really so important for statistical thinking, but just for being a good citizen. And the first is Dewey defeats Truman. So this is a picture that probably everyone in the room has seen. Uh, the Chicago Daily Tribune posted, uh, uh, gave this, uh, published this newspaper on November 3rd, 1948, with the highlight, Dewey defeats Truman. Uh, of course, it was published before the final result came out. Indeed, Dewey did defeat handily his Republican contender, Thomas Dewey, who was governor of New York at the time. And so why did they do this? Why did they print Dewey defeats Truman uh, before the results were there? Well, they thought that Dewey would win in a landslide. And they thought this because all three highly regarded pollsters at the time had called the election in favor of Dewey anywhere between 5 and 15 percentage points of the popular vote, which is a complete landslide. Of course, Harry Truman won the vote by 4.4 percentage points. Why did they screw up? Why is this referred to as the biggest election fiasco of almost all time? The first is they were guilty of ignoring the basic principles of statistical survey and statistical design. Convenience sampling. You ask people what, who they're going to vote for if it's convenient for you. The worst way to do anything. You choose to interview the people that you can access most easily. It doesn't represent the real, it's not a reliable estimate of the population. And of course, many data collectors went to affluent neighborhoods, and this excluded poor and middle class residents, which severely biased the results. As for the Chicago Tribune, uh, they weren't an official pollster, but they did something far more scientific. They ran a telephone poll of how people would vote, and they did this by random digit dialing, which is supposed to be a much more fair way of trying to reach households at random. But the problem is that random digit dialing could not have worked in 1948. And the reason is that the vast majority of people in 1948 didn't have telephones, unless they were middle class and above. So again, even with the best intentions of random digit dialing, they excluded poorer citizens. Okay, the third example, sports. We all love sports, students love sports. So why not tell them about Simpson's Paradox? Okay, Simpson's Paradox is named after Edward Simpson, who was a British code breaker, uh, based upon a technical report he wrote in 1951. But of course, Simpson's paradox actually dates back to uh, Carl Pearson and Udney Yule. They discovered it in 1899 and 1903. And what Simpson's paradox says is that the weighted average for a statistic can contradict, can contradict subgroup trends. It doesn't say it will. It says it can. And so, to make this very concrete, I'm going to use an example from baseball. So the example that I'm using from baseball here is Derek Jeter, who played for the New York Yankees, and David Justice, who played for the Atlanta Braves. And these are their batting averages in 1995 and 1996. Uh, so in 1995, you can see that Justice had a higher batting average than Jeter. Um, and in 1996, you also see that Justice had a higher batting average than Jeter. But when you combine the data, Jeter has a higher batting average than Justice. Just think about how nonsensical this sounds. It, it means that 
I'm better than you in one task, and I'm also better than you in the other task, but I'm worse overall? How does that make any sense? So let's see why it makes sense. So first of all, looking at this data, in 1995, you see a very different picture than 1996. First of all, the batting averages for both Jeter and Justice in 95 are relatively low. But in 1996, they're relatively high. The second thing, which is even more important, is that Jeter's 1995 low batting average only came from very few at-bats, 48. And so therefore, the 90, 1995 at-bats don't strongly factor into Jeter's overall batting average. However, David Justice had the exact opposite problem. What happened is that his weak 1995 season comprised a vast majority of his attempts at bat. And that's why it can happen that despite Justice having a higher batting average in each season, together, Jeter has a higher batting average. So that's a nice way to think. There are many examples of Simpson's paradox in the real world. Um, it, go, you know, it goes back to um, when you're looking at hospitals and saying, should I trust a surgeon? And you look at their success rate and you wonder, oh, it's an only 83% success rate. Um, and you say, well, another doctor has a higher success rate. Should I go to that doctor instead? Well, of course, everything is conditional. All probabilities are conditional. And so what you need to look at is the fact that the guy who had the 86, or, or the woman who had the 83% success rate might have had all the harder surgeries. And so this is another example of Simpson's paradox. It's everywhere in the world. Okay, so once you've captured their interests, and I hope I've captured your interests if you haven't heard about these things, you need to utilize a teaching framework that works for you. Mine is the following, but it's for me. I take a fundamentals-driven approach in which I think very carefully about how to convey abstract ideas in a way that resonates for newcomers. I also think very carefully how to logically connect one concept to the next concept. And yes, in the article that Jade Boyd wrote, it is true that I spent eight hours the first time I taught the course in each lecture. The second thing is that at all costs, I avoid plug-and-chug methods. Does no use whatsoever for students to memorize equations and formulas. Students seem to understand the how and the why, not just the what. I explain these concepts in as many different ways as possible. This isn't a teaching philosophy. This is just a fact. Every student is different. Every student learns in a different way. One size doesn't fit all when you teach people. And above all, I seek to make the relevant materials relevant and applicable to the real world, and I'm constantly in the search for new examples that do it. Well, not only do you have to have a teaching framework, you have to have a right environment. And for me, the right environment is the following. First of all, I state in my syllabus very, very explicitly that there are no stupid questions. I think that it creates a safe space for students to take risks and ask questions that otherwise they might not have asked. This is really important. Secondly, leave no student behind. Always ask students if they have questions before moving on to the next topic. Take all the time you need and re-explain concepts even if only one person doesn't understand. I know you're thinking, how do you do this? Why managing a research load? Coming up for tenure, all these things. Well, you just have to work double or triple, triple time. That's why we became professors after all. We knew that it wouldn't be a 40-hour work week. And so this could be a lot of work, but it's worth it. And this review from spring 2015 reinforces that for me every time I think about this. I was nervous coming into class, but the way Ernst teaches it is so clear and helpful for every type of learner that it is impossible to not understand the material. If you do, he will personally make sure that you reach understanding. Um, the next thing I do is I constantly seek anonymous student feedback. I still use SurveyMonkey. I read every comment, I keep track of the pop popular comments, and I adjust accordingly. Students give you tremendous credit if you actually listen to them and adjust in real time. They feel that you have actually listened to what they think is important. And that can be a deal breaker and change everything for you. And so it's really only when you listen to your students that I believe you can achieve true excellence. Finally, every student deserves a champion. Show each and every student that you want them to succeed and that you take their success personally. I truly do believe that each student's success is my success. And why do I do all of this? It is extremely rewarding. 
it is more rewarding than anything I've ever had in life. Because as invested as I am in my research, and yes, Dr. Garrett said I've won many nice research awards and big awards that I'm very proud of, but my research doesn't always yield immediate impact. I'm more on the theoretical side. And teaching does. And when students see your investment and enthusiasm, they buy into the experience and reward you in return. So let me tell you just about a few of these rewards. Reward one, revolutionizing a student's perspective of academia. Okay, it sounds too good to be true, but one course can forever change a student's perspective of academia. And that's a win-win for everyone in this room. One of the greatest professors I have met inspired a class to return the outstanding amount of enthusiasm and effort that he showed us it would not be an exaggeration to say that he revolutionized my impressions of academia and life as a whole. Well, another thing, before I go on to the second reward, was inspired by Yusuf Shamu's 2016 George R. Brown keynote address. And Dr. Shamu said something very powerful. He said, remember, we are their parents when they are at rice. And I couldn't agree more with this. I don't have to be a father to know this but it's absolutely true. Rice parents are not only trusting us to be terrific instructors, they're expecting that we'll do our best to guide the children outside of the classroom. And of course, they're also expecting that we care about them not only as students, but as people as well. And a statistic is that six of my previous students <laughs> have gone on to PhD studies in statistics, and one is already a PhD in statistics. That feels really good. Okay, so. There are countless rewards, but I want to say reward four to reward n, where n is just a very large positive integer, finite positive integer, and it's just knowing that you made a difference. And that, to me, means everything. It means more important. The fact that I know I made a difference means more to me, without question, I'm going to say something very bold here, than any research award I've ever been given. Hands down. And why? One of the best teachers you will have in life, not just as Rice, he's beyond amazing. Dr. Ernst, I'm a better person having met you. Thank you again for everything. If every professor were like Ernst, I think I would just stay at Rice forever. <laughs> in some ways, Ernst is like an honest politician. They're so rare, even though they should be the norm. So I guess they think I have a future in politics. I don't at all genuinely cares that his students understand the material and do the best they can. He would probably come to your college commons at 9 p.m. and help you solve your homework problems. Well, I'm not sure that's true, but I'm glad they think that would be true. <laughs> so closing remarks. Teaching is anything but easy. It requires tremendous dedication, tremendous focus, tremendous commitment, and tremendous vision. But the rewards of teaching, and I hope I've convinced you of the rewards, are more vast than any art I know. As William Arthur Ward said, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. And so I want to thank University, Rice University for having entrusted me to teach this class. I really hope I've inspired a new generation of students, or at the very least, I've made an undergraduate requirement an unforgettable experience. <laughs>